Hey there, you know who. Now, before we start into all the detail about identifying and managing electrical hazards in the workplace, let's take a minute to make sure that we understand what those hazards are. Now, when we're talking about working around energized equipment, the major hazards, the big three, are shock, arc flash, and arc blast. Now, shock is defined as a dangerous electrical condition associated with the possible release of energy caused by contact or approach to energized parts. Electrical energy flows through a part of the body, causing the shock. Now, there are more than a few of us working around energized equipment who have been buzzed at some time in our careers. Now, shocks can range from a mild tingling sensation to a serious jolt. Now, they may result in no injury or they may cause devastating injuries and even death. Burns are the most common injury from electrical shock, though other injuries such as neurological damage can also occur. Every year, more than 300 workers are electrocuted on the job, and every year, more than 4,000 workers miss work due to non-fatal electrical injuries. Now, some people use the terms arc flash and arc blast interchangeably, and they occur simultaneously, but they're not the same. Arc flash is the extremely high temperature discharge produced by an electrical fault in the air. Arc blast is a high pressure sound and pressure wave caused by a sudden arc fault. An arc flash is an electrical discharge through the air when insulation or isolation between electrified conductors is breached or can no longer withstand the applied voltage. Then an arc flash occurs. What we're talking about here is a phase to ground and or phase to phase fault. Although most electrocutions and shock incidents occur on 120 volts, catastrophic arc flash incidents occur almost always in applications above 120 volts. Either event can happen when electrical equipment is being serviced, maintained, or inspected. Now the temperature of an arc can reach more than 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 35,000 degrees. I mean, steel melts at around 2,800 degrees. So an arc flash puts out more than 12 times that amount of heat. Now, an arc flash is characterized by a brilliant flash of light and a loud noise, like uh, the sound of an explosion. This flash of light has been responsible for causing blindness, and the blast of sound has caused hearing damage and deafness. Now, when an arc flash occurs, an enormous amount of concentrated radiant energy explodes outward from the electrical equipment. An arc blast is caused by the almost instantaneous heating of the air from the flash and the vaporization of metal. Hot gases and melting metal fill the air like shrapnel. People who have been victims of an arc blast have had pieces of metal embedded in their skin, their bone, and even in their teeth. Now, as you can imagine, this blast of heat can cause severe burns. And in many cases, arc flashes or blasts have killed a worker right on the spot. Now, as with any blast, pressure waves can also cause damage to internal organs, including lung and brain damage. And if you think you have time to duck or get out of the way, forget it. An arc flash or blast can happen in a split second, and those who have survived these horrible incidents have said that they barely remember the flash. And afterward, they never knew what hit them. Now, arc flashes have occurred when a worker was simply removing a cover or trim from a piece of equipment. Arc flash and arc blasts can also occur in panel boards and switchboards, in transformers, fuse disconnects, or virtually anywhere where there is a possible failure of electrical equipment, including branch circuits, and circuits and equipment used for temporary power on construction sites. So. What can you do to protect yourself from potential electrical hazards? Now, the very first issue that you need to address is can the equipment be de-energized? In the interest of working safely, always do whatever you can to work on de-energized equipment and never assume. If someone tells you that the equipment is de-energized, don't take his or her word for it. Verify that the equipment truly is de-energized. And next, you gotta ask yourself, Am I qualified for the task I'm about to perform? Are you able to distinguish energized from de-energized? Are you able to determine the nominal voltage of the equipment to be worked on? Do you understand the safe approach boundaries for shock hazards as described in NFPA 70E? 
Do you know where the flash boundary is? And what the incident energy exposure is where you will be working? And do you have the decision-making skills necessary to determine the magnitude of the hazards and how to protect yourself through job planning and PPE? Now, if you answered no to any of these questions, you're not qualified. And if you aren't qualified to do the job, don't do it. I mean, it's as simple as that. And by the way, for more information about job planning, check out the job planning program on this DVD. Next, you need to do a hazard analysis. Now complete the analysis by identifying, eliminating, or reducing as many hazards as possible. Once remaining hazards are identified, then determine the level of PPE that you need to do the job safely. Procure the PPE and make sure that you've had training on the equipment and the procedure at hand. And this training should include how to recognize and avoid hazards, the PPE policy, the energized electrical work policy, lockout tag out procedures and requirements for achieving an electrical safe work condition okay now let's talk about your personal protective equipment and you know the old saying the best PPE in the world does no good if you don't use it and use it correctly now those who do not wear protective clothing while working on or around energized equipment are not only in violation of the standard but are foolishly putting themselves in harm's way the heat that is generated by an arc flash has the potential to ignite non-flame resistant clothing. Polyesters and other man-made materials such as acetate, nylon, polypropylene and spandex may melt to the skin, causing second and third degree burns. The most recent edition of 70E includes requirements for basic protective clothing and PPE based upon arc flash potential at the work site. Now other hazard levels or other tasks require clothing to be determined by detailed analysis. 70E even provides charts to help determine the level of proper protection required for working around energized equipment. Now these charts work together and you should become familiar with them. The first is a set of tables that assign hazard risks zero to four that signify the amount of energy that could be generated by an arc flash. The higher the potential energy, the higher the hazard risk, and the greater the thermal protection required. 70E also provides personal protective clothing and equipment matrix with suggested levels of clothing and or equipment needed per hazard risk category number. For instance, untreated cotton, wool, rayon, silk, or blends of all these materials are examples of non-melting flammable materials that are acceptable for hazard risk category zero. Now anything higher than hazard risk category zero requires FR clothing in minimum calorie levels as designated by the current 70E standard. Now these are minimum suggested calorie levels with recommended undershirts and underpants to be worn as underlayers. For hazard risk categories one, two, three, and four, determined from the tables, there are specific minimum calories per centimeter squared levels of flame resistant clothing required. Other exposures determined by analysis must have PPE sufficient for the exposure. Now while there are protective clothing systems designed for use up to 140 calories per centimeter squared, when working on equipment with greater than 40 calories per centimeter squared, additional engineering control should be taken to attempt to minimize the risk and energy levels prior to attempting the task. Now take care of your PPE. As you're well aware, these items they are not cheap. Follow the manufacturer's care instructions found on the label. Voltage rated gloves and sleeves are a vital part of the PPE system. Wear them. Clean gloves and sleeves of foreign substances and remove any traces of oil or other flammable or combustible materials. Gloves, sleeves, and blankets must conform to ASTM standards and must be marked with dielectric test dates. Using gloves over six months after their test date is a violation. Inspect your PPE before putting it on. Look for holes, tears, punctures, cuts, swelling, softening, hardening, loss of elasticity, and stickiness. If you see a problem with the PPE, remove it from service. Store items in an area that's clean and not subject to temperature extremes. It's always better to complete an arc flash hazard analysis and reduce or eliminate as many hazards as possible. Then 
decide on a reasonable PPE policy to address the remaining hazards. And remember, any equipment that can be de-energized should be de-energized before any work is done on the equipment. 70E suggests a clothing system in an Annex H of the standard that may simplify FR clothing requirements. There are many, many tasks that you probably do in the course of your job that require specific PPE for protection. When taking voltage readings, you need to be extra careful. Changing breakers, adding knockouts or fittings to panels or enclosures, pulling wire into energized panels or adding circuits to energized panels. Every one of these tasks requires you know the proper protection for each task and wear your PPE. Now before I conclude, here are a few common scenarios that should be familiar to just about all of you. Okay, let's start with the most basic. Never allow extension cords to lay in standing water. And never run unprotected extension cords across roadways, aisleways, or walkways. Never leave energized panel boards and switches open and unguarded. Never replace a fuse with a section of copper pipe. This is an invitation to disaster. Do not pick up temporary power from an existing switch or panel source that's not intended for this use. And never use NM cable 4-inch square boxes and duplex receptacles to make extension cords. Now you may think that you're saving time and money, but in reality, you're creating a very dangerous situation. While NM cable is used for temporary wiring, it must be supported and protected from damage. And speaking of creating a dangerous situation, let's talk about temporary lighting. Hanging temporary lighting by the wiring or fixtures is a bad idea. Unless the fixture was designed for this purpose, and not many are, you could be creating a shock hazard. And don't use unguarded temporary light bulbs. Make sure that the bulb has a protective cage surrounding it. Now come on, let's be honest. You've either committed one of the infractions that I've just mentioned, or you've thought about it. Now when you've gotten away with sloppy work habits for years and years, some guys become complacent. Complacency created by a lack of respect for electrical hazards. And believe it or not, complacency can get you killed just as sure as incompetence. Okay, now that gives you a brief look at Electrical Safety 101 for all you guys who work on construction job sites. And remember, this video, it's not intended as a training program. It's an overview. For more information, refer to the latest edition of the NFPA 70E. And keep in mind, almost any job you perform while working on or around energized equipment has the potential to put you at risk, serious risk. So make sure that you and your coworkers are adequately protected, don't take shortcuts, and never assume.